Have your Bibles if you want to turn with me to John 20. John 20 is where we're going to be at this morning. Last week we looked at a passage in Matthew where Jesus told the religious leaders that when they asked him, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus looked at them and said, the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And the second is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. And we talked about last week that there are three movements there in that, in that verse. There's an upward movement of God the Father. There is a, um, there is, there's an upward movement of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That's why we gather to lift up the name of Jesus. There's an outward movement of loving our neighbors, loving the people around us. But there's an inward movement of growing together, looking inwardly, and caring for one another. And that's what we want to call you to do as we uh, do this series and prepare for membership, which we're rolling out here in a few weeks. And if God is calling you to be a part of Lost City, we would want you to gather together regularly to worship Jesus, that we would want you to be committed to uh, going with the body on mission, wherever God calls us, and that you would be committed to caring for one another as a family. The purpose is that we want to be in alignment with what we are about for the sake of of the gospel in our city. And if you haven't heard part one, I'm gonna, it should be up um, probably by today, and I'd encourage you to go on, on our site and listen to the first part of this message. This morning, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why we go. We gather, and then we go. Several years ago, when we first began, one of the first things that we did was um, there was one Sunday where we canceled our Sunday morning service the way that we normally would do things, and we, um, we went and became the church in the neighborhood. We went into the Camelot Apartments, which is right behind us, and we, instead of gathering here, we went there and we just set up tables. We started serving people lunch. We set up a basketball court. The kids started playing. We did activities for the little kids, and we just hung out there um, with the neighborhoods, and we just built relationships with the people in that community. And when we first started thinking about that idea of doing that, I actually had a little pushback from someone in the church that was part of the church at that time. And he came to me and he's like, I can't believe that we're going to cancel Sunday morning worship where we gather and sing about Jesus and talk about Jesus and we're going to go have lunch with our neighbors. Um, and he was giving me a little pushback and good reasons. Um, but he actually never ended up coming to the apartments and eventually ended up leaving the church. Solid theologically, but he wanted to know more about Jesus instead of wanting to make Jesus famous in our city. And he had some good questions that I was pondering on as we were even there that morning at the community. But God began to quickly answer those questions in my heart as we began talking to people and building relationships. I started realizing that God was just as much in that apartment community that morning as we were as he was when we were here sitting and talking and singing about him. God was there as we were talking to people about their lives and their struggles, and as relationships were forming, he was there. It was meant for Jesus. All of it was meant for Jesus. Most of us think that the gospel calls us to this neat, organized type of life. And if you want to control things, and it's easy to put your faith into like these little blocks of times here and there, and then let the rest of your life be whatever you want it to be. But sitting there at that lunch, realizing that Jesus was there at that lunch just as much as he was here on a Sunday morning, if he's there, then he's everywhere. He wants to be everywhere. Not only that, he was ministering to those people through us. There's a huge part of church that's about gathering, but the church is more than just gathering. And what I began to realize is that as the church, we're called to be the church everywhere. God is always at work through his people, and he is at work in that lunch at Camelot, and that started the way, changed the way I started looking at church. Church isn't something that you just fit into a block of time one day a week. Church is all of life. It's not just about a weekly meeting that we do. It is Jesus' desire to fill the world with his presence. Jesus wants to fill the world with his presence, whether it's at lunch or it's at a workplace or it's at a classroom or whether it's in our relationships or whether it's we're gathering here on Sunday morning. He wants to fill the world with his presence. 
This morning, we're going to talk about the idea of being the church wherever God takes us. If you have your Bibles, John 20 is where we're at. Jesus, after his resurrection, gathers his disciples together, and he commissions them before going into heaven. And here's what he says in verses 21 and 22 and 23. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven then. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Just like last week when we talked about gathering, here in our text this morning, we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit mentioned together. We'll hear this over again and again and again, Father, Son, and Spirit. Why? Because we believe in a Trinitarian God that sends us into this world. We want to know Him, and we want to show Him to the world. And I want to, this morning, look at how each part of the Trinity is involved in us going out. God the Father. Verse 21 says, As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. What do we know about the Father? Go all the way back to the beginning of the story in Genesis. We remember God created the garden for Adam and Eve, and everything was good, and they had perfect harmony, perfect relationship between God and man, and God would hang out with them, and there was this intimate relationship between humanity and God. And if you remember the story, Adam and Eve blow it. They rebel. They try to be their own gods, and they reject God. And so what does God do? He doesn't wait for them to come and repent. But we see the story that God actually shows up in the garden after they sin. And he calls out to them, Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? God pursues them instead of waiting for us to pursue God. He actually comes into the garden. He begins to look for them. He goes after them. Listen, guys, we have a pursuing God. He pursues us. He chases after us. He pursues us so much that he sends Jesus to pursue us while we were yet sinners. It wasn't that we fixed ourselves and then God approved us. While we were yet sinners, God began to pursue us. God always desired to pursue and bless the world with his presence. And you got to get that. God pursues us. Remember the story of Abraham. Abraham is an idol worshiper in his, in his city, and God calls him out. And he separates him, and he says, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make you a blessing, and through you, all of the nations of the world are going to be blessed. Israel, God's people, had priests. And the whole point of the priest was to mediate between a holy God and sinful people. The priests would mediate so that their sins could be forgiven and that God could dwell among the people. But in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was called a royal priesthood. He wanted the nation to shine forth God so that other nations and other people would look at Israel and say, that's the God I want to follow. That's the God I want to serve. That's the God I want to be after. God wants to pursue there's some people that think the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are like two different gods. One is a mean God that's always judging and punishing, and the God of the New Testament is full of grace, but that's not true at all. The entire story from Genesis to Revelation is God pursuing his people. God's going after them. God wants them. He wants to be near. He wants to save, and that's why he sends Jesus. Adam and Eve couldn't do it. Israel couldn't do it. You and I, we couldn't do it. We need Jesus. We need a Savior. That's why Jesus was sent. He was sent on the Father's behalf to know and show the Father to everyone. He was sent for the Father's work. In fact, in the book of John, Jesus predominantly refers himself to himself as the sent one. Jesus embodied the Father's heart wherever he went. Don't miss this. Jesus says, if you want to know who my disciples are, they are people who have been sent by me. As the Father sent me, so I send you. In John 13, Jesus makes a statement, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Do you know what Jesus is saying there? You can't know what love looks like unless you're in relationship with one another. Why? 
Because God himself is in community. Every person in the Trinity is excited about making the other person glorified. That's perfect love right there. We can't make God known in the world without a community that's loving one another. That's who God is. We talked a little bit last week about households in the New Testament and how households had tons of people living in them, sometimes 20, 30 people living in one house. These houses were getting wrecked by the gospel. Lives were being changed by the message of the gospel, and Jesus is alive, and his love is being poured out, and families are being saved and coming to Jesus. 20, 30 people in one house at a time, but there's a problem there. The problem is, When there's a lot of people, when there's more than two people normally, even if it's just two people, you get frustrated in community. You get angry in community. You get burned out in community. You're not going to want to forgive one another. You want to hold on to grudges. You want to stay away from people that are different from you. And it didn't hit me till preparing for this that the context where Jesus was telling his disciples that you're supposed to love one another... When he said that, he was sitting around a table, the Last Supper, right before he was going to be captured as a prisoner and eventually executed. All of his disciples were sitting at the table with him. One of the disciples that were sitting there was a man by the name of Judas. Judas would be the guy that would ultimately betray Jesus and turn him over. And listen, Jesus knew that he was going to get betrayed by Judas. He knew that. What would you do in that situation where if you knew someone was going to hurt you? My instinct would be, I want to protect myself. I want to protect my family. I want to protect my friends. I want to make sure I'm safe. I've got a mission to accomplish. There are things that I need to do. We have a task to do. And we're not talking about petty little issues that we disagree on. Judas is going to turn Jesus over to be killed. But Jesus' biggest concern at that moment wasn't worrying about his safety. It was about showing the Father's love. Think about this. If Jesus had looked to protect himself and his friends and stopped Judas, Satan would have ultimately have won and we would have lost. Jesus wouldn't have gone to the cross and our sins would not have been forgiven. But Jesus had his eyes fixed on the Father. And here's another thing. It wasn't that Jesus didn't care about Judas. In John 13, verse 30, it says that he was grieved and troubled by the fact that Judas was going to betray him. Why? Because the issue wasn't merely about fixing or correcting a backslider. The issue was over a man who was created in the image of God, whose heart was bent against the Father's heart and the Father's love, and there was where the problem was. You know, when I'm in the middle of an argument or when I'm in the middle of a fight, I don't typically tend to stop and say, if that person really knows the love of the Father. That's not my primary concern when I'm in an argument. But do you know that the Father loves you? The Father wants us to embrace His warm embrace and wants us to experience His warm embrace. I was thinking, how much more quickly would we be able to get to reconciliation if we understood how much we're all in need of the Father's love. Do you know it? Do you realize how much he loves you? See, this is why Jesus was able to sit with the very person that was going to betray him. I wonder how redemptive our conflicts would be if we made it more about the Father and about Jesus than we made it about ourselves. And that's what the world is crying out for. When the world sees a community that bears one another, loves one another, works things out together, they're going to say to themselves, that's the kind of love that's a different kind of love. That's the kind of love we want. So you want to know the love of the Father? You're going to actually have to want to need the love of the Father. And you know how you need the love of the Father? You actually have to go to someone that you can't love unless God enables you to love them. When I struggle with loving someone, maybe it's someone that just 
doesn't get it even after hundreds of times of hearing and I just want to rip their heads apart or yell at them and say, why can't you get it? What God's been teaching me is that those are the type of people that God actually puts in my life to draw me closer to God and say, God, would you teach me to love you more so that I can love these people more? Those people that are hard in your life, that are difficult, they're there because God wants to teach you to love God more because God loves them unconditionally and he wants you, his love to flow out of your life into their lives. And so I've been learning to say, God, help me to love you more so I can love others better. better. God wants us to learn to love him. God loves people. He gave his only son for them. So when we go and we serve and we reach our community, what we do is say, God, let your love shine through me. Teach me to love you more so that I can love other people more. And this is something that we need to desire every single day. The Father wants to be known. He says, taste and see that I am good. As a church, we're called to love one another. We're called to love as family. This is how we're going to know the Father, and this is how we're going to show the Father. If the world is going to know what the love of God is going to look like, listen, guys, we have to go. We have to go. If you are going to know what God's love looks like, you have to go. God the Father, God the Son. Our text says that Jesus was sent. How do we know Jesus and how do we show Jesus? How was Jesus sent? He was sent as a servant. How do we know Jesus more? We know him more by doing the things that Jesus did. And listen, that's scary. That's incredibly scary. People are going to know, not just by us telling about the king, but they want to see the kingdom. You can't know the king apart from the kingdom. You can't separate the two from each other. We have to be kingdom people by showing the world what Jesus is like, by serving people like we will serve Jesus. The early church would care for the orphan, care for the widow, care for the poor, care for the homeless. There were constant selfless acts of love that was being displayed. Why could they do that? Because these were the very things that Jesus did. And Jesus was present with them. Their priority was the least of these. Why? Because that's what Jesus' priority was. Can I say this? It would be weird and unnatural for a follower of Jesus to not make the least of these their priority. That's un-Jesus-like. But it's been flipped in our culture because we have been taught we don't care for anyone else but ourselves. We only focus on ourselves. But when you look at Jesus, Jesus can be walking toward a city and someone will stop him in between and say, heal my son or heal my daughter. And Jesus will stop whatever he's doing and pay attention to the person and care for them because he cared for the least of these. The early church was known throughout the region because of how they cared and loved for the least of these. That's what the church was known for. Can I ask, what are we known for? Are we known for good messages and good worship? Or are we known for what Jesus is known for? Of how we care and love and want to see God made famous in our community. That is what God is calling us for. This is how Jesus wants to be shown off in our city, caring for the least of these. And you've got to ask yourself, am I okay with that? That's where Jesus wants to be. Are we willing to go where he is? Are we even willing to ask Jesus where he wants us to go so that people, to be with people that he wants us to care for? Listen, guys, Jesus cares for the broken of this city. He is the God of this city. And he cares about the broken that are in our community. He wants to heal. He wants to feed. He wants to clothe. He wants to care. And let me be completely honest with you. It is those times when Someone will come here knocking and asking for food and I take them to Taco Bell and sit with them and talk to them and hear their stories. It is in those times where I actually experience the love of God more than I do even sitting here in our sanctuary. Because when I care for the least of these, 
In those moments, God reminds me, this is how much I have cared for you even more. Because you were the least of these. You don't deserve my grace and my mercy. You don't deserve my love. But you have received it, not because you deserved it. And now you get to bless others with it as well. And I'm reminded of those moments, how much God loves me. And to think that the way God feeds, clothes, and heals, and cares for the people in our city is through us. That's how he does it. Think about that. He wants us to be involved in the healing of the city. And when I think about my life and all the things that I have on my plate, a lot of things going on, mostly good things, I realize that my priority is never, God, who are you calling me to love? God, who are you bringing into my life? My priority is me, myself, and I, and that's it. But when we stop and say, God, who are you calling me to serve today? Who are you calling me to love today? We're actually representing Jesus, the King who loved us when we were poor, broken, and sick. Here's another thing. When we begin to live our lives looking for ways that we can show Jesus to the world, it brings us to a place where we are absolutely dependent on Jesus. Because we trust Jesus with our lives. We trust Jesus with our money. We trust Jesus with our resources. And we believe that Jesus will take care of us. We also trust Jesus with our time. Because our time belongs to God. And we say, God, I'm going to go spend some time with someone and love on them and embrace them, and I'm going to give them this time because this time belongs to you. And we're not going to waste our time. You want to know Jesus more? You're actually going to need him more. And do you know how you need Jesus? When you go and serve the least of these. We love people as if they are part of our family, and we serve people like Jesus would serve them. Because that is how, how we know King Jesus, and that's how we're going to show King Jesus. If the world is going to know the king and what his kingdom is like, we as a body, we need to go. If you want to know what the king is like personally, if you want to experience the kingdom of God breaking into places of darkness, you have to go. You've got to go. God the Father, his amazing love. God the Son, Jesus, who is sent as a servant, and God the Holy Spirit. Our verse says that Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Do you want to know what the power of the Holy Spirit is? In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, and then verse 8, Jesus says, while they were staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 8, but you will receive power from the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. The Spirit is how they got their power. The Spirit that the Father promised and the Spirit that Jesus sent to his people. And listen, guys, this is where real security is. Sit on this for a couple seconds and think about this. God with you. The creator of the universe in you. God with you. The world longs for that kind of security. Why do we long for that kind of security? Because God made every single one of us completely dependent on his power. We are made to bank everything on his power. But you need to ask, why do we get that power? Because a lot of us are walking around and we don't feel like we have that power. We feel weak. We feel beat up. We feel discouraged. And a lot of us have felt like that at times. God with us. God with us. How do we feel that? Why do you get the power? Jesus says in Acts 1, you get it so that you can be my witnesses. This is a missionary people. If you're just going to sit back and read your Bibles and go to church every Sunday and hang out with people that make you comfortable and make you feel good, you're never going to experience the power of God the way God intended it. 
People don't get to know the power of God till you step out on mission. Jesus didn't get the anointing of the Holy Spirit in his own life till he began his ministry. The purpose of the Holy Spirit in your life is so that you can live on mission for Jesus. Not so that you can feel good. Not so that you can say, I experienced Jesus or something. God empowers you and fills you because he wants to make his name famous through your life. I grew up in a circle in a, in a church where it was all about being filled with the Holy Spirit and it was an experiential movement. It was all about Sunday morning. But it was never about living our life on mission for Jesus. And I study Acts and I read the book of Acts and they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they're moving and they don't just sit there and just gather together. That's not all they do. They go into the city and they embrace the city and the whole city knows about them because they're moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. The people didn't get the power until they stepped out as witnesses. They were healing people. Miracles were happening. Lives were being changed. And I don't think the magnitude of that gripped us has gripped us. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that was doing miracles in the book of Acts is the same Holy Spirit that's inside of us this morning. God has not changed. He hasn't changed at all. He isn't any different. But do you believe that when you go out and when you love your neighbors and when you embrace your community that God's power is with you He's with you. He wants to heal through you so that Jesus will be lifted up. Do you believe that? Do you believe that when you are talking to someone, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say, that they need to hear so that Jesus' name will be glorified? Do you believe that when you pray for someone, that God has the power to heal them because he hasn't changed at all? You look at the early church and they're threatened. They're going to prison and they're losing their lives. These guys were able to look at folks and say, it doesn't matter what happens to my body. The only name that we want to declare is the name of Jesus. They preached and the Bible says that all of Jerusalem was filled with the teachings of Jesus. Why? Because these people knew that God had changed their lives, that God is powerful and alive, and that gave them boldness and courage to proclaim the message of the gospel. A lot of us get stuck and fixated on ourselves and how poor we are on doing this journey. How poor we are on loving people, at loving Jesus, at being the church. I want to warn you and encourage you at the same time that you need to be careful of that. Be careful when the goal of your life can subtly shift about managing or fixing your problems. God doesn't make victims. God makes missionaries. God's power is sent, is meant to send you out as God's witness to good to the good news of Jesus. He's not going to give you his power so that you can make it about yourself. He loves you too much to let you do that. He wants you to see that those selfish moments as you need him for him to change you. He wants to You to know that he has chosen you for ministry to do his work even in your weakness, even in your mess. You will never go if you think that somehow you need to fix yourself and get your act together before you can go. Let me be real. God wants to use you in your mess, in your weakness. And you want to know what else? The world that God's calling you, it's a messy world. You're a mess, the world's a mess. And yet God chooses to work through you so that Jesus looks good. And only he looks good. Jesus wants the credit. And listen, that's the point. If you think the point is about making you look good or our church look good, you're wrong. The point is about making Jesus look good. That's why we boast in our weakness. And if you think it's about you and the Spirit is there to make you look good, you're going to live a life that you can pull off on your own. A life that has no need to depend on God's power. And if you want the power of the Holy Spirit, you go on behalf of Jesus and be His missionary people. That's where your dependency on God increases. 
This is what a missional church is. This is what God's calling us to be. People who love like family, who sees that the love that God has poured out on us, we're called to pour out on other people. People who serve to show the kingdom and tell people in the power of the Spirit about their king. This is the kind of church that God is calling us to be. That's how you're going to know the power of God and show the power of God. God wants to be known in our city. God wants to make his name famous here. If this world is going to know what the power of God is like, as a body we need to go. If you want to know what the power of God is like, you need to go. Listen, God's opening doors for us here to serve in his power. Let me mention a few things. Numerous times a month, we have opportunities to go and serve our city and bless our city. Yesterday, there's a few folks that went to the homeless shelter and served. They're going again this Saturday. If you're interested in seeing God's power being displayed through your life, I encourage you, go this Saturday and serve the people that are in our community. Every first Saturday of the month, a few gather together and they walk around this city and just pray, God, would you make yourself known in our city? They pray for the schools, they pray for the neighborhoods, they pray for the government offices, and they pray and say, God, make yourself famous. I encourage you, be a part of that. We're partnering up with a ministry called Free City, and we're hoping that beginning next month, we can serve refugees that have just moved here from to Dallas from parts of the world that have been ravaged by war and famine, and we want to bless these families. That's where God's power is going to be shown when we serve there. We're praying about how to reach students on the campus of UTD, international students and other students, and we're praying that's where God's power is going to be shown. On Sunday, April 27th, a couple months from now, we're going to cancel service again and we're going to go serve at Camelot and Bell Grove and we're just going to pray, God, will you make your power shown? This is where we cancel our service and we go and we love our neighbors. We're hoping that we, as we do that, God's power will be shown and people will come to know Jesus. There are people in our church that are willing and taking time to go and serve at the nursing homes that are in our neighborhood. There are so many opportunities for you to be involved in, in being a missionary. This is your identity. This is what you are supposed to be known as, as a child of God, sent ones. We're serious about this. We want you to engage the world that God has called you in with the love of Jesus, representing the King, going in the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to see you on mission for Jesus whether that's at your work or with your family or on your campus. One of the things I'm praying for this year, personally, for our church, is that as a corporate body, that every man and every woman will have a daily opportunity to encounter someone with the gospel with both word and deed, daily. Listen, that's a God prayer. That's this prayer that's saying, God, I only care about what you want me to care about. So show me people that I can love in word and deed. That's an exciting prayer to pray. Jesus wants to fill our city, and he wants to use us to do that. Let me encourage you to be praying that God, how God wants you to step up and serve and be the missionary that God's called you to be. We're about to close and head into communion. Let me say that most of us live our lives in such a way that we don't need the love of the Father. Or we live in our lives in such a way that we don't need Him to show up, or we don't need the power of the Holy Spirit. We can do the lives that we're living on our own. Can I say that's boring? Because when you're living life under the power of the Holy Spirit... God will do things in and through you that you would never imagine. He'll take you places and do things through your life that only God could get the glory for. Let me also be clear. We don't emphasize being on mission because being on mission isn't the solution to all of our problems. The only answer is Jesus. It's not pretty going on mission, but you need it. Because we know when you are living on mission, 
you'll need to know the Father's love in your own life. You will need to sense the presence of Jesus in your own life. And you will need his power in your own life. That's why we're calling you to commit to this. We need this, and this is good for us. In a few moments, we're coming to the table, and I want you to know that being sent, there is nothing that you have qualified so that you can be sent. The only reason that we are sent is because the one who is qualified has sent us, and he works through us. Please be clear about that. It is all about Jesus. It's not about your ministry. It's not about your giftings. It's not about your talents. It's not about how many people you can reach with the gospel. It is all about Jesus. It is only about Jesus. We need Jesus. Let me remind you this morning that you are greatly loved because Jesus died to save you. So when you come to the table and you take that bread that symbolizes his body, You take that bread because his life was lived on your behalf. So every time you doubt God's love, you look at the cross because the cross reminds you that you are loved. We drink that juice because we get to say that our sins are truly forgiven because the blood of Jesus was spilt on our behalf. That we belong to Jesus. And because we belong to Jesus, He tells us how we live our lives. And the thing that he tells us is that we are called to live it out in the world that he's placed us in. So this morning, let me encourage you. First and foremost, would you let the love of the Father grip your heart, grip your soul, grip your mind this morning? Would you let him remind you how deeply loved you are? Would you let Jesus remind you that he is your king? that you are doing his work, that you are living for him. And would you let the Holy Spirit remind you that you don't go in your own power, in your own wisdom, in your own knowledge. God is with you. He empowers you. He enables you. He fills you. And he will use you, and he will get all the credit for it because he is the only one that deserves all praise and all worship. As you reflect this morning, as you meditate, I'm going to invite you to examine your hearts, your attitudes, your affections. When you're ready, you're welcome to come and grab the elements from the table and go back to your seat as the worship team leads. And now come up here in a few moments and we'll partake of the table together. We celebrate communion every week because we need to be reminded that it's about Jesus. It's only about Jesus. It's not about us performing It's not about us doing mission. It's it's only about Jesus. It's us being obedient to him. So Father, this morning, we want to thank you for your great love in our lives. Thank you for loving us while we were yet sinners. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for making us a part of your family. Thank you for Jesus who came to serve who willingly gave up his life so that we can belong to you. Help us to model Jesus in our world. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that empowers us to live the life that you've called us to live and to be your witnesses in our community and in our neighborhoods. Use us for your glory. As we come to the table, we come humbly, recognizing that this is your work, this is your doing. Would you have your way in our lives? We love you. In Jesus' name.